Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I am joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. The Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listofrederick.com. But we are rejoined from the Washington Post, Mr. Sam Fortier. How are you doing on this hot Friday evening, sir? <laughs> uh, I actually just, oh, wow, I got a standing O from Reed. Standing Thanks, up. man. Standing I appreciate it. Uh, I just moved into a, a basement apartment uh, in Parkview in D.C., so I'm actually staying pretty cool okay. uh, away from the heat so far. Yeah, yeah, I keep I keep most of my victims in basements, and they they usually tend to be cooler. Like they, <laughs> that's the one complaint I don't have is they're like it's always cool. So good for you. Yeah, and, uh, it's very thoughtful. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And just watch out for the floods. You know what I'm saying? Being in the basement there, Sam. But I just wanted to say I wanted if next time we see Nikki Giovala, just let make sure we tell her like congratulations, thinking of her, the fact that she rang the bell, you know, got over the cancer diagnosis, everything. I, no, we didn't know about that, and it's really awesome that she had the strength to get through it. I'm really happy for her. That was awesome. But Sam, we're talking about training camp, brother. It's coming up on Tuesday. The time is flying by. So looking at this training camp, Terry McLaurin has been re-signed. What are your expectations going in? Like, what is something you are personally excited to see? Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how he and Terry look together on the field. Uh, I think anytime you talk about a, a star receiver getting that sort of money, wanting to see him sync up with Carson, uh, I think it is going to be key. And, and we're probably not going to see um, – we're not going to see the the full fruition of that until, you know, week one of the preseason against Carolina um, or, or even longer um, just because of how these things go. But I'm looking forward to seeing that rapport and, and certainly some training camp battles we can get into. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing kind of the, the overhauled offense. And, and also, you know, if, if the defense can, can solve these concerns as I've been digging into this off season, you know, how disappointing that defense was last year, um, even though they didn't change many pieces, I think they, they kind of have to be better. Yeah, uh, 100%. It's going to be very interesting to see how the defense kind of bounces back from last year, especially with the strength of schedule on paper at least being easier. But last season, of course, we'll start this off a little bit easy before we get into the harder ones. Last season, uh, we had a guy like DeAndre Carter who made the team. Nobody really thought about DeAndre Carter heading into the season. He was always kind of forgotten about. Who do you see kind of being this year's DeAndre Carter, somebody who kind of makes the roster without having a lot of noise pre-camp? I think – um if you can qualify like one of those undrafted free agent linebackers, yeah. the, the Drew White, the Farad right. Gardner, like those type of guys, I think I think at least one of them is is going to make it. Um, and Ron kind of alluded to that during minicamp when he was like, "Hey, you know, we got some, we got some young guys out here on defense that we really like. And we're probably not going to be able to keep all of them." Um, if you if you want to, in the same vein as DeAndre Carter, I think that uh, Alex Erickson like is kind of the same skill set. I wouldn't be surprised if he made it just because of how deep that receiver room is. And then you're talking about Dax Milne, uh, who uh, you Harmon. know obviously was tangential to some other off season news mm -hmm. this, this year with uh, My Zach favorite Wilson. off season story, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't see Alex Erickson, you know, having a, a strong chance to make the roster, but who knows? And then I know some people, uh, Mark and Michelle did have a really good mini camp. I don't think that that is going to be enough to get him on the team just because of how deep this team is. But, I mean, he did impress uh, in some limited practices. Yeah, and one thing, like you said, I'm sorry, before we move on, the return position, both returner spots are open. So if Alex Erickson or somebody, I know he's proven in the past, can kind of prove it there, then that's a good way onto the roster. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And speaking of stories, um, everyone knows, like, the larger storylines about, obviously, Carson Wentz, how's he going to look? How is the defense going to look? How is these receivers going to jail? Curtis Samuel, whatnot. What do you what do you think is an underlying or a sorry? What do you think is a kind of a low key kind of like storyline that the fan base needs to know about or look forward to in training camp? One of the things I'm most fascinated by, like as I've been going back through why the defense underperformed, like they were historically bad on third down against the pass. Like if you look at some of the advanced numbers, if you watch the tape, like there are just some coverage busts that, that don't make sense. And there are just some like, like the numbers just kind of look out of whack, even with like, you know, the second worst team in the league at that. Um, so to me, like, I'm very curious because, you know, Jack Del Rio has played a lot of zone, a lot of, you know, uh, soft, you know, off zone on third down. I'm very curious to see how 
if Benjamin St. Juice is going to go to the slot, how are you going to mix and match coverages so you get the best out of a zone corner like Kendall and a man corner like Will Jack? Like, to me, how are you deploying each coverage each way in what situation? Like, that I think is going to be a fascinating development and, and kind of what I alluded to earlier about how can this defense get better without changing personnel? Right. I absolutely agree with that. Now, Sam, with Carson Wentz, right, there's a lot of talk. Consistency, he's been well with interceptions and turnovers. You could say he's generally consistent with it. It's just his play. He has these outlier seasons. So what can Washington do to get the good Wentz this season? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, like, Scott Turner would love uh, some thoughts as well because, like, Hmm. if you look – there was a clip on Twitter on point. It was either at the beginning of the offseason or at the end of last year – it's like a two minute clip of Carson Wentz throwing left-handed from last year Really, where like the dude just gets out of the pocket and it looks like his brain fritzes and he'll throw an interception backed up in his own end zone, or he'll be on the goal line about to score and he throws it left-handed. Like, like I think that Terry, I actually, Terry during his presser when he signed that contract was like, I think Carson Wentz is valor in the pocket, you know, his, his ability to, you know, keep a play alive back there and throw it up for a receiver is super underrated. And I actually think that like, that's a really complicated nuanced part of Wentz's game, because while right. he does that, he takes those sacks and he sometimes makes those turnovers. And it's like, that's always been him. Like that's been his rep coming out of North Dakota state. And so to me, like, can you get him to get the check down on time. And this is something Frank Reich and, and, you know, his past coaches have talked about when he was in Philly, when he was in Indy, like, can he make those layups at a high enough rate where then, you know, like the mistakes aren't as bad and the booms are better. Like to me, like the Colts last year, if you look at the DVOA, like they were the worst at throwing the ball at or behind the line of scrimmage, which is where Washington's been very good over the last two years. Right. Like Taylor Heineke and and Alex Smith, if, if nothing else, like they knew how to like get through their reads and get the ball to that, you know, to JD McKissick. So to me, it's like, is JD McKissick and, you know, people in that role, Curtis Samuel, if he's healthy, can you be effective, especially as defenses now are going so much too high to take away the deep shots? Can you use that underneath space if you're Carson Wentz consistently? Yeah, I, I think that's huge. I think that is kind of being overlooked a little bit by some people. It's going to be very interesting to see how Carson kind of uh, pans out over here with these deep threats, in it, but also having that talent underneath, like you said. But so moving on, of course, one of the biggest stories was Washington losing Brandon Sheriff. I, I think we kind of have Andrew Norwell kind of penciled in at the left guard position. Who do you see overtaking that right guard spot and filling in those big old man bearded shoes? <laughs> uh, I, I would have to say Trey Turner is probably that dude right now, just based on what we've seen in camp and, Wes Schweitzer's played really, really well. Um, there was actually a story in Outside Magazine today about his rock climbing, and I, and I know that's been huge for his career, so shout out to Wes. Who, it's insane. I, it is. I wrote about that in the pandemic, like how he was getting into it, and it's been really cool to like see him. Because he like I don't think people realize this. Like That dude is probably pound for pound the strongest dude on the team, yeah. and he doesn't do upper body weight workouts. Dude does not bench. Dude doesn't do any of that stuff. And he's 330 and climbing like V6s as a, as a rock climber, which is insane. Imagine me being up on the rock wall and this dude just 300 pounder just flies up the wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's Spider-Man. crazy. Um, I, I would say Trey Turner is probably the guy just based on, you know, his comments in minicamp, Wes's comments in minicamp. But um, but I, I think it'll I think it'll be a competition. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's going to be a, definitely a competition to look out for. And going back to last season, obviously, Carter Samuel was the big topic of the uh, offseason, rightfully so. And people saw him in many camps, OTAs running around. But there was a couple uh, times where he missed it when the media was out there. And then people uh, see the picture of everyone out in California throwing around. Carter Samuel's out there again. So obviously, people take to Twitter, the fan base, and they just start like thinking about, oh, what's going on with Curtis? What's going on with Curtis? Do you think that's anything to like – really worry about going into this off season? Like, what are your opinions on Curtis Samuel going into this season? Every time I try to figure out where Curtis Samuel is at, I, I look mm-hmm. like a fool. So I'm just going to say until he <laughs> proves it, until he is there week to week, if he can be in a game and he can show up and not be on the side field on practice, I'm just going to say, I don't know. Because, you know, for as explosive, I said it during minicamp, he came out, he looked like a different dude. Like, you know, you could see it against Eric. He was cutting harder. He looked faster. And he talked about being in Florida with John Bomarito, his trainer, 
you know, getting past the groin injury, learning to trust, you know, his, his body again. And then, you know, you come back the next day, he's on the side field. So t- until, until we see consistency and he's out there every day, uh, I'm just I'm just gonna plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. The Dave Chappelle bit. I absolutely love that. <laughs> uh, now, Sam, I only have a couple more questions for you to wrap this up. First one being, there was rumors circulated this week that Washington and the Cowboys were mutual interest in Anthony Barr, the free agent linebacker. Do you do you, have you heard those rumors? And do you think that there's actually some smoke behind it? Yeah, I think there's a lot of times, especially this is especially prevalent during the draft, right? Like yeah. team X has interest in player Y. Right. And I'm always like, I'm always a little, you know, skeptical because it's like, okay, what does interest mean? Did, did they call their agent? Because that's the GM's job. It's like be in touch with agents. Hey, right. how, you know, like th- that to me is not, I'm more interested in like, did they bring them in for a workout? Have they, you know, offered a contract? And so I'm I'm always skeptical. Obviously, Ron has said that he is interested in bringing in a veteran free agent linebacker. Um, we haven't, you know, seen one of those yet. So I assume we'll see one here in the next two weeks. They might want to get to camp and see it. But Anthony Barr would certainly fit that description. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but I, I think there's always cycles of of buzz about people who are, have interest in in this player. And um, as of right now, I, I don't think that we're going to see something imminently. Okay, I agree with you. Now, one of the players that it's going to be, they're going to be very important, especially early on in the season. Not saying they're not always important, but Casey Tuhill is the backup defensive end. He's going to be playing if Chase Young can't start the season. What are your expectations for Casey Tuhill? Are you confident that he can step in and do well? Yeah, you know, with that toe injury that he had before camp last year, and then I, I never really felt like he got. Um, he got going and, and he was a, I never felt like he was a disruptive force last year. And that might've been by design, because if you remember Ron talked about after chase was out, he was like, Hey, well, we have some blue collar guys who can step in and basically let Montez do his thing. Because when you have four first round picks in the defensive line, everyone's trying to get theirs. And I think there's sometimes where you have trouble getting everyone to buy in and just play the assignment, especially when you're not getting your numbers and you know, you got, you know, you're thinking about money down the line anyway. Um, Casey Tuhill actually told uh, a paper, he went to Stanford, um, he told the Stanford paper he did not like his pass rushing um, from last year, so I would expect to see, you know, refined technique from him there. Um, I would uh, I would also say that I would not be surprised if James Smith-Williams um, and him are competing for that job, and, and okay. maybe even F.A. Obata. So I assume, like, those three guys are, are kind of in the mix to start opposite Montez Sweat if Chase Young is not ready for week one. Do you have a favorite that you think that would win it? I mean, F.A. Obata is a former Panther and has more experience and is a massive person. Yeah, he's um, a freak. <laughs> so I would probably put, you know, more chips on him, but I do know that I think they like James Smith-Williams. I would probably go Obata, Smith-Williams, and, and Two Hill if I had to rank them. So I picked yeah. the, the wrong, one I wasn't supposed to, Sam. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Starting off great. Last one I have for you. Uh, Carson Wentz was slided in the Madden ratings. They had him below Mac Jones, Justin Fields, Tua, Tango Vailoa. They had him below Trevor Lawrence and others. Rate him at 73. What, what was your reaction to that? Do you think that makes sense? Uh, I, I hate to disappoint you again, but I personally – don't, don't care about. I know you don't ratings. care. <laughs> I, like, like, uh, so, so to me, I mean, is it? It's kind of crazy, like that. Mac Jones uh, in year two, especially because I know with the Mad Rings, like they don't really, right. um, they don't really give those guys. I think it's like corners. I was reading they don't give um, boosts or whatever. They were talking about players in year two um, who didn't who didn't get. Uh, they don't. They rated. don't gas up rookies in their second right. year, essentially. Right. So for Mac Jones to be rated ahead of Carson. I don't, I don't play a ton of Madden except like when I'm trying to figure out like coverages and like you know like look at things how to look at things. But um, my old roommate did. And I know there's like traits. I would say like Carson being a 73 feels a little uh, lower than like his ceiling. Like his he's probably at his worst. He's probably like somewhere in the 60s. But I think that his ceiling is much higher than that. And so I'm kind of surprised. You know, if they had been like, oh, he's a 79, but like if he really gets cooking, he's you know x and and if he's really bad he's y like to me it's like the variance is so high that i'm surprised they kind of shot lower uh, on the rating but in general i i I have to applaud the nfl because they have turned like 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 you made schedule release like a primetime event and i was like wow like they really pulled it off like that's amazing 
but turning the Madden rating releases into like a, a week thing. of content, genuinely, I'm not even like, I'm not even being facetious right now. I really think that's impressive. It is. It uh, is. And the, the other thing real fast to remember with Madden ring, ratings, they can adjust them every week. I, I mean, they, they do. Yeah. So like if Carson gets hot, really? he's going to go up. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I did. I did not even know that. Right. So, yeah. Sam, I really appreciate you taking the time being able to explain, uh, answer that question, even though I know you don't really care about Madden ratings. You're good. And I don't either. Honestly, it's just, it's something to talk about just to help the time pass until Tuesday. I hope you understand. Sam, uh, what would you be rated? Yeah. Sam, well, Sam, you'd be a 99 in terms of no, podcasting. If there's a video game, hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> wow gassing me up i appreciate it. I, I did see um that that cheeseman got like a 30 something <laughs> and, and that I was they always like, have I was long like, snappers low but come on the guy's last name alone 30 like 60. oh man dude That's if, if that were me and i woke up and i was like someone <laughs> like someone the other day was in the office and they were like this dude 30 like <laughs> yeah i would send an email I feel like I could roll out of bed and be at least a 27. So somebody who does it for a living. (laughs) Absolutely. Sam, I can't thank you enough, brother. Go and enjoy your Friday evening and good luck at camp and make sure to keep up that great work that you're doing, sir. For sure. Thank you guys. I always appreciate appreciate you. Thanks, Sam. Until next time. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the man from the Washington Post, Sam Fortier. The greatest one. Another thing for Madden ratings. I'm sorry, but, uh, that's interesting is they've done over the last few years, they've kind of changed the way that they rate quarterbacks because they want there to be a big difference between you playing with Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, as opposed to you playing with a Teddy Bridgewater, Carson Wentz, like all these, but the fact that Teddy Bridgewater is rated over Carson Wentz, not even like two points higher than him is just to me, it's just like, how, what planet, when has for them to even have Justin Fields or, like you say, any of those guys, Teddy Bridgewater. I get some of them I get because of their athletic ability, and that does play a part in the ratings. But it's like, yeah, like, really? Like, come on. I, yeah, I just, it I, doesn't make any sense because what I what people had told me as why I was asking about Jamar Chase not being as a top 10 rated. They were saying, well, they don't gas up rookies. You know, like, year. The, yeah, they keep them. De- well, then how in – in but, the world is Carson below and then near Trey Lance to the point where Trey right. Lance is one Trey Lance is higher than him. Yeah. Or no, he's one below him, but it's just like, what are we doing here? The dude played a couple snaps and you're saying that he's come on. <laughs> it's just <laughs> ridiculous. Like I said, a lot of it's athleticism, but yeah, but now we are joined by our next guest, Mr. Anthony Armstrong. How are you doing brother? The believe commanders podcast. Yeah. What's going on? I'm good. I think after we, I think after we uh, met up last time, that's when, I got an email about the doing the podcast. So, like, y'all kind of kicked it off. It's cool to be hey. back. Appreciate y'all having me. Hey, I'm not sure. One of the last things you told us last time we talked, you you said you had something cooking. And I was like, hey, man, I'm looking forward to seeing what you got. I didn't know that you had that in mind, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's just it was, it was an opportunity that, um, you know, sometimes stuff shows up. It shows up whenever you're ready for it, really. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I've been thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. And I, I've had to recently – be real with myself and say, shit, I can't do everything. I can't, <laughs> can't, I can't like produce it and then shoot it and then edit it. And then I can't do all that stuff. I can't, I, I got too much going on. So that, that came up and I was able to take advantage of it. Sorry. It took so long. I lost my cup of coffee. No, you're good to go, brother. You're all good. Now, one of my, my first question that I have for you, because when you, your first start in the NFL, obviously I want you to take me to that day, the moments leading up to it, the minutes, the hours, because Jahan Dotson, obviously the first round pick that the commanders took in the first round, his first game's coming up. I want, I want you to kind of explain to us in the audience what it's like for a player to go into your first starting game in the NFL. Well, shoot, my first starting game, I think it was against, I think it was against Green Bay. It was after, uh, after we played uh, Philly. And I had I had like a big catch, and then I, they told me I was going to get the nod against Green Bay. So that was that was pretty cool. Um, it was very surreal. I mean, I always say it. Every single bit of my NFL career was just all surreal, and like almost didn't just couldn't believe it. I mean, mm. coming in as an undrafted guy, older older guy, uh, shoot, just being able to make the the week one roster was was a, was an awesome feeling. Um, but I mean, going into training camp, either draft pick or undrafted. Like, this is what you dream of, you know, and then you're just one step closer to getting there. Um, there's a lot of anxiety, you know, a lot of things built up and you have to trust yourself. You know, you have to understand, hey, I put in the work, you know, there's a reason that I'm in this position. It's not because of 
luck and happenstance. It's because hey, I've actually done the done the, the job on the field. I've made plays. I've I've executed on offense. I've done what I had to do, and now it's my opportunity. Um, so whenever you know Jahan gets that or any other rookies get their opportunity, you, you gotta you gotta take it. I mean, I, being real, I I dropped my first two passes mm-hmm. against Dallas. Mm-hmm. Um, ironically enough, it was a there's a picture of it, and I got a whole stack of them. But I'm like, in the back of my head, I'm like, I dropped that pass. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> nobody nobody else knows it, but I'm like, I'll sign it and send it to you. But I'm like, that was a drop. I should have like my first catch should have been a touchdown, um, but. It, it's okay. I mean, I'm having a pretty solid career either way, but getting getting to, getting to play in the league when it's something that you've literally dreamed of, you know, your whole life, you're sitting there watching the combine, you're watching your favorite players, and now you're lining up next with next to them and across from them. Like it's a surreal moment, um, and they it, any rookie should really embrace that because it's an NFL I means not for long, right? And they should really really embrace any opportunity they get on the field. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I think is important that you said is that if a, if you're starting, there's a reason that you're starting. I mean, there's a reason that you've been there. You've done everything right. So you kind of just got to focus on that, that the coaches have faith in you. That's why they put you in there. One thing that made headlines this week, I don't know if you saw it, but there's a certain NFL analyst who uh, made some pretty hefty projections for a certain Chase Young. Uh, Booger McFarland said that he would not be surprised if Chase Young had 20 sacks and set the force fumbles record. Now, as a guy coming off of seven and a half sacks his rookie year, one and a half sacks last year, coming off of a huge injury, we'd have no idea how much time he's going to miss. Is that something that is actually obtainable for Chase? And I think I know the answer, but. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it is definitely a, a lofty goal. And it's something that I can say that he, Chase Young has that potential to get there. Like he right. has that in him. I think that's why he's drafted so high. Uh, everybody, you know, felt that he could be that type of player. Is it going to realistically happen this season? I, no, it, he doesn't have enough time. He's not right. going to have enough time on the field, right? Coming off of a major, major injury. Um, it's a very long season. Team doesn't have a draft, uh, not a draft pick, but a, a, a bye, bye week until week 14. Like, it's a really long year, and you don't want to try to rush him back in there. I'm a fan of hopefully, you know, you can – the team can put some wins together and and not have to rush him back out there. I mean, I would love to see him show up right around that bye week or maybe even after the bye week and then have a fresh Chase Young going into the final parts of the season, got a couple of division games, probably trying to fight for a playoff position. I mean, I'm happy if he gets seven sacks in the last four or five games and, and, oh, and yeah. the team goes into the playoffs, right? Like yeah. 20, 20 and, and, and 20 sacks and breaking the force fumble yeah. uh, record. Yeah. I think Booger's probably a year or two too early on that. Right. But it is definitely something that you know Chase Young could, could accomplish. That, that is one heck of a statement, Anthony, because I feel like that is a very quality argument and discussion to have between fans. Basically, would you rather have Chase Young come back and play early on at half strength, or would you rather him wait until week 14 and be at 100%? I think that's a great and quality question right there. Sorry, Hall. No, nah, I mean, it's a good point, because if you, even if you think back to his rookie season, like we talked about um, like last week or earlier this week, that first half of his season, his rookie season, he went through that injury, missed a game or two. And then he actually said, like, after the bye week, he came back the second half of the season, and that's when he kind of went on that tear, that stretch, and started putting up all those crazy numbers. So definitely would be a good argument. Yeah. But um, you got also, you got to also look. I'm sorry to jump in. You got to look at the type of injury that he has, right? Right. Um, and the position that he plays, he has to take on a lot of force. Mm-hmm. And you know, it is what it is in the league. We're not going to sit here and say anybody's playing dirty, but I can guarantee you, the first time he touches on the field, he's going to see a cut block. Oh, yeah. somebody's right. going to throw a cut block right at him and they're going to see how are you going to react mm-hmm. because if he wow. is tipping around and he doesn't and he doesn't trust it yet then you probably need to just get him off the field mm-hmm. um because if if one guy doing a cut block is able to negate chase young then the teams are going to be like oh, okay cool he's he's not ready yet so we can run at him we could we could do whatever we need to do because he's not really to, to ready to take on the the force you, you got to take on 300 some odd pound linemen you got people trying to cut your knees he's got to read and react and spit like there's a lot that goes on in a drill like a rehab thing that is a a known like you know when you're gonna cut you know yeah. when you need to make your move you backpedal five yards plant and break on an angle you know when that stuff happens now whenever you don't know what the snap count is you're trying to rush the passer and you're trying to you know dip and spin back underneath that's all read and reaction. 
Um, and he has to learn to trust himself in that first. And then when he gets in the game, it's totally unscripted. So it, it, I, I say, take your time. You want, you want Chase Young to be in Burgundy and gold for 10 years rather than 10 games. Right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've I mean, seen that play out before with RG3 try to like yeah. come back faster than he should have and kind of uh, hurt his career. You could say that, but looking ahead, like you said, the training camp, we mentioned Jahan Dotson, obviously Terry got the big contract this off season, much deserved. And hopefully Curtis Samuel can get onto the field and be healthy, give you 13, 14 plus games this year. As someone that played the position in the NFL, what do you think that this, uh, these three receivers can kind of bring to the team and how are they going to attack these defenses um, on Sundays if they're all, all three of them are healthy and ready to go? You know, um, uh, the good thing is that they they bring a lot of ability and it's going to give Scott Turner and the offense a lot of options. You know, uh, ideally those two guys plus a Logan Thomas returning, you know, if Cole Turner turns into something, um, you throw in the running back position, they can take some pressure off of Terry. Uh, it feels like last year, you know, last couple of years, you knew who the ball was going to go to in a key mm. situation. Uh, and Terry's good enough to make those plays. That's why he got a bag, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's going to come down to the creativity that Scott Turner has and the, the offense as a whole, Carson included, to execute that. Um, training camp is, you know, I'm, I'm sure they've been, been practicing things in the offseason. Uh, but once you get into that season, they got to try to tweak some things here and there and see, see what type of identity that they want to have on this team. Um, is it going to be a more of a horizontal type of a thing? Get get the ball in space, let those guys make some plays. Are they trying to go, you know, run the ball, go play action over the top? I mean, you've got a lot of options out there. I think that um, putting those guys in space will be very, 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 very helpful. Um, and, and whoever is opposite of Terry, if it's Jahan first, or if, it, if Curtis comes back, whoever it is, they got to eat. Because you're going to get served one-on-one -on -one coverage. Because Terry Terry's going to get two people on him to start mm -hmm. the year, right? Safety over the top, corner up front. They're going to play a two-shell, probably have some sort of a linebacker that's kind of lurking up underneath. And they're going to make Carson Wentz hit somebody else with the football. And if, if Jahan Dotson, if he, if he can beat press, he's going to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one opportunities. I remember – uh, that 2010 year I was out there with Santana and we would literally ping pong week to week. Like he'd have a good game and then I wouldn't do much. And then they right. the next week, those teams would adjust to stop Santana. And then I would be able to benefit. So I, the first three, four games of the year, teams are going to test Jahan and he's going to have to step up to the plate to make defenses change. And I, I think he'll be able to do that. Totally agree. Now, before I want to get your, uh, some, well, I want to do some fan questions with you before we get out of here. But I have a, my own personal mm -hmm. question for you. Diami Brown and Curtis Samuel both are kind of your more gadget guys. You know, Terry and Jahan, you alluded to it. They're more the outside guys that can run any all the route tree essentially. Curtis Samuel's more closer line of scrimmage, and Diami Brown being that long stride. What are your expectations for those two? Man, starting with uh, you start with Diami. Diami, you know, we don't get to talk about him that much. You know, I'm right. really excited about him to see him uh, get into the fold, and now he's got his quarterback uh, showing up there as well. So he he, it's time for him to make make a jump, right? He's gonna have to make a jump. You don't want to get pushed down to the bottom of that depth chart too much. Obviously, they've made two big splashes at the receiver position. Uh, first round pick signed signed one guy last year in free agency. And then they just secured another one. So you have to assume, hey, they got three that, that are there. Um, so Diami is going to have to find a way to try to make an impact on offense, but more likely it's going to be something on special teams. I mean, mm. is it going to be the return game? Is it going to be being able to cover kicks, make some tackles? I mean, you got to find a way to get on the field anywhere, right? So he's going to probably come in, you know, four, five on that receiver uh, depth chart. But he, he's he's not going to get as many opportunities in the passing game, in my opinion, to make as many plays um, in in game time situations, right? In practice, absolutely. Right. But during the games, they're not. It, 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 you don't usually get five, six deep in in the game. Right. right? They put you in yeah. on a run play on the backside, right? And he can't get stuck in that spot. But if he can make some plays on special teams, and then show up show up in training camp and continue to make plays day after day they'll find a spot for you on offense but he's gonna have to make his way on special teams first right. that's my thought um that's awesome curtis yeah what do you say 
I said, that's awesome. Real, that's a great quick. way to explain it. That's something too yeah. that you don't, I haven't really thought of it. Diami, like you're right. He's going to be that fourth, fifth receiver. And usually those guys make the roster because of what they can do on special teams. Yeah. I don't know how versed he is on special teams. That's not something I've ever really heard before. So that's very yeah. interesting. I think so you, I mean, he's going to like, I, I had to do it. I had to right. go. I mean, right. I eventually ended up starting, but I still started on like three and four special teams. Right. I right. still covered kickoff. I still was a gunner. I'd run three, four plays on offense. We'd punt, and I'd be covering kicks. Right. Um, you're gonna have to. He's gonna have to make that impact somewhere just to get on the field. They're gonna, you know, they got to find a reason to keep you. Um, and there's no knocking him. It's just, the, it's just the way the game is. Yeah. Uh, Curtis, you know, obviously we just got to get him healthy. You know, yep. we get him healthy, and and if he's able to get out there and just be any semblance of what he was able to do in the past, then I think you're gonna have, you know, a, a good. A, a good weapon out there. Uh, but I, I think the way the contracts are, are made up, I mean, I, I think somebody said that they could get out of this contract if they needed to. They have four uh, years in the back year. end. Yes. Yeah. See, so, you know, he, he's got to get healthy. He's got to get on the field. He's got to show up. Um, ideally he, he's able to make an impact, but if, if you're not healthy yet, I really, you can't even make much of a, a, a projection about what he's going to do on the field if we can't even get you on the field first. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah, I got you completely. Yeah. Oh, now, hey, real fast, I got I got one question real fast, just because you would, I mean, this is your area of expertise, you would know. But I mean, as a wide receiver, especially one with some speed, what is it like kind of going from a quarterback with, I guess you, I don't want to say anything bad about Taylor, but a, a noodle arm going to a <laughs> six five quarterback with a laser rocket arm. Shout out to Peyton Manning for that bit. <laughs> but, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'll give you a comparison that the, the quarterbacks I worked with, at least the main two, Donovan John McNabb and yep. and not John Beck. John John Beck had he has a little pepper in on on his, right. on oh, his does he? passes. Rex Grossman. Oh, Rex, he had a very strong arm, didn't he? Or Rex, no, maybe Rex, that was coming out. He he Rex didn't have he he didn't have as strong arm as Donovan. Like Donovan right. had a his a was house, unreal. Yeah, right. Um, it was never in a spiral. That sucker was flying up, but it was going <laughs> fast. He almost knocked my head off my first first time he showed up. We ran routes. I ran a curl route, and he had thrown the ball, and I turned around. And I just reacted and moved. Right. I wasn't ready to catch it. I was like, okay, I got to be better in my footwork because he's throwing the hell out of this football. Um, <laughs> but. The thing about Rex was he where he didn't have as much arm strength, he was very decisive in his decision making. Got my kids over there getting yelled at right now. They're supposed to be they're helping they're helping their mama cook a cake. Um mm -hmm. and I guess they're making a mess. Um, yeah, it's okay, but, dude. On Monday, Reed's kid got his head stuck in the uh in Yeah, his my son got his head stuck in his high chair uh oh wow so oh, while we were recording you, it was really funny did so you worry. finish did you finish or did you say I, i'll be right back I, I sat there for a second and then i was on my phone <laughs> and I, I hit the stop the video button because i didn't want people to see me being a bad parent <laughs> but i left the audio on so it was, it was just like me like man what the what hell are you, are you doing? doing how did you get your big ass head in here yeah oh my <laughs> gosh kids man i tell you they're they're they are great but man, they they work you. Oh, oh know. man, dude. There. Now, Anthony, they if, make you better. If you don't mind, I only have a couple more questions for you before we get out of here. But um, I want to answer some fan questions. I want to do a roundtable discussion, but I would like if you could answer it first. This is from the Colonel, one of our big time big time fans. Using one of Kyle's favorite words, our defensive secondary was putrid last season, giving up a league high thirty four touchdown passes. Have we done enough to improve our defensive secondary? Should we be going after that Bengals safety, Jesse Bates? Um, well, on paper, you, you know, you don't have any, you don't have any additions to the, to the team where you're thinking, okay, this is going to be it. Um, you have to hope that it's going to be the team just gelling and, and, and being better, finding a way to improve as an overall unit. Um, uh, they moved juice, uh, St. Juice to the slot position, six, three, 200 plus, uh, he should be able to be a mismatch against the receivers he's going to be against and, Ideally, let's say if he gets really good at it, he can he can lock down some of those those tight ends that we're going to see, some of those passing tight ends. Uh, he, it'd be interesting to see him get in that position and not have to put a linebacker there. I, I know that a couple of years ago that was a a very bad position, uh, very bad matchup for the team was was getting tight end linebackers on on tight end. It was horrible. Yeah. So overall, I mean, on paper they haven't done anything to improve it but you have to assume that they're learning and they're playing better as a unit and hopefully being healthy will help that. 
um, and looked into the Jesse Bates situation, the only thing about that is he wants to get paid. And if you look down the line about yeah. who's next to get paid, do you want to throw in another person in there? Right? right. Like, do you want to try to pay him? Cause then now you got to think who else is up next to get paid. Cam got Girl, Cam Paul coming Hulk. up already. Yeah. Right. Plus, Mon- plus Montez, Chase, Duran, if you, you want go. to. Plus the quarterback. Yeah. Right. We you got you essentially got two years to decide. Obviously, That's you know, point. if he plays, if, if Carson plays well, he gets him, he's gonna get re-signed. But if he doesn't, now you gotta go and draft a guy and then it's a whole other thing. So have we done enough to improve it? Has the team done enough? I wanna say on paper, no, just because you haven't brought in another player. But I'm not gonna say that it's the same. I, I won't assume that it's going to be the same. They know they need to play better. They yeah. know that. I mean, they're, they're grown ups. They're going to be good. They're yeah. going to be all right. I do think that there's a lot of it. It's natural with the competition that they were facing. They went to the gauntlet of these veteran quarterbacks. I mean, Josh Allen, you're looking at the list of the top 10 quarterbacks in the NFL last season, and Washington faced nearly all <clears> of them. And so, obviously, their defensive numbers are going to go away. And that mimicked what they did in 2020. They went against a bad row of quarterbacks. Their defense looked really, really good. I think naturally that is going to even out on top of what Anthony basically said is being acclimated to the system, going into third season under Jack Del Rio and this defensive staff. They kind of know what they're, what they're getting into. Instead of it being learning, it's refining and getting sharpening things. And that can really pay dividends if everyone's on the same page. So I think naturally the numbers are going to go down. And I, I like Jesse Bates a a lot but the one knock on him last season since he was he wasn't good in the regular season but it wasn't until the postseason that he showed up and I would love Jesse Bates here obviously he'd be an upgrade but like to Anthony's point it's very 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 expensive and you got to be cognizant of what that would mean in the future what about you Reed uh yeah I mean like you like we talked about we didn't really do anything in the offseason we didn't add anybody uh really much depth at corner you know I mean we lost Landon Collins granted I know the position Landon Collins played but still I mean he he could help out in the passing game at times with some of those big tight ends um but yeah I mean it's it's definitely they should improve like you said because they're not going to be facing a murderer's row of quarterbacks and there's kind of that age-old thing with where cornerbacks tend to take two years to kind of get adjusted to a new system or whatever it is and so I expect a bigger jump from William Jackson I think he should be better so while they didn't make any improvements they should be better I would imagine however you're right. We can't really say that. But the Jesse Bates thing, unfortunately, no, that's a lot of money tied up right there. Yeah, he's just trying to get the most out of Cincy. I don't even think no, he wants to leave. I know. If, if I, were, I, if I like Jesse Bates. In person, man. he'd he's, say no. He wants to he's stay. awesome. <laughs> right. But. What do you think, Hall? Yeah, I mean, y'all pretty much hit all the points. I just think that um, not adding anybody, I think last year might have been the problem, but they added so many new pieces to the back end. Yeah that they didn't have a lot of time to gel. Um, You could see the communication last year was kind of bad. So hopefully with those guys being around each other for a full season last year, you got St. Juice coming back. Hopefully he stays healthy. Hopefully the communication's better. Guys know how each other plays on the back end a little bit more. And yeah, hopefully Del Rio can kind of switch things up and get these guys in the right position and kind of try to get them. Because I feel like also last year, guys were trying to make plays and try to, they were kind of playing outside the scheme, trying to do too much. So Hopefully yeah. they can just kind of yep. they'll even kind of get him to settle down and play within the scheme and let the uh, yeah. let the guys up front make plays while they play on the back end. I, I, I honestly I think it's I think it's good. Last year the defense was very loud, and I say loud as in like they were like, oh yeah we're, we're going to have sack records and that right. really right. press very yeah very vocal like what we're going to do. Usually you know that I mean? slaps you in the face too. Yeah, you Eagles know, and, dream team. Yeah, right. So it's like you know what, hey. Maybe it's good that it's just like, look, we're coming off of a, a bad season. Let's just let's just get to work, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't got to you don't got to you don't got to ask no question. You don't got to say nothing. Just show up, <laughs> punch somebody in the mouth, and keep it moving. You Anthony, know what I, mean? I punch each other in the mouth. I absolutely love that because one of my biggest things I hate about sometimes with this franchise is that we have a player in there early in the training camp or preseason come out and say, like, we're going to be one of the best offenses in the leagues. We're going to be one of the best defenses in the league. And it always blows up in our face. Pierre Garçon is a guy that uh, comes to mind with one of the comments that he made. And I just want to stop. Nothing. Just don't say anything. Let's just go to work, just like he said, Anthony. But I can't thank you enough for joining us again, Anthony, and being able yeah. to pregame for this training camp, sir. I know you got a lot on your schedule. But before we let you go, just in case there's anybody watch it, doesn't follow your podcast already or know you on uh, uh, social media, if you just like to plug your social media accounts in your podcast. Yeah, appreciate that. Y'all can check me out. I got the Believe in Commanders podcast. Just see me retweet some of those stories. I do that with, with uh, Brian Murphy. 
Uh, out of, he's out of Atlanta, so he's a he's a big Washington fan as well. So it's it's fun to talk ball. We had Taylor Heineke on. Uh, no way. Two, two episodes ago. Yeah. Did, so did you ask him about him. about that picture that came out of him sitting on the bench with that girl, and it said something that was like, "This is still my number one quarterback," and it was Taylor <laughs> from the back. It was like, "Good for you." All right, Taylor. I Good didn't up. see that. I wish I would. I would have. I would have questioned. It. It was, it was a good conversation. I, Taylor's a Taylor. I, I like where he's coming at to this season. I know y'all may be running out of time, but see, I'm I'm enjoying the. Uh, the no, you're good. Right Keep, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, Taylor, Taylor, Taylor. I think he's going to be very important to the success of the offense. All right. You wonder like he's a backup quarterback. Yeah, think about. It. He's been in this. He's been. He's had the longest relationship with Scott Turner than mm. basically anybody on the team. He was drafted. He was brought in as an undrafted free agent when when Scott was in Minnesota. Yep. And he basically followed him around, so he knows the offense. So when young players need have question, they can ask him. When Carson has a question, they can ask Taylor. Like he, you have an extra guy in there. Um, so I think he's going to be a big part of helping that offense gel and, and just kind of smoothing some things out. And he, and he's, and he's assumed that QB two role and he's fine with it. You know, he's yeah. not, he's not in there trying to take somebody's job and you know, he's a competitor. So obviously, yeah, he wants to play, but he understands, Hey, you pay, like you said, you pay some guy 30 million, you pay another guy, 2 million. Yeah. <laughs> you got, yeah. you got to play those guys. But right. um, now hit me up on Twitter, Mr. Armstrong 13. Y'all can hit me up over there. Um, Believe in Commanders podcast. Come check it out. Love to love to have y'all, you know, over there. Of y'all course, can come uh, on sometime too. Sure. We're we're not mm-hmm. as uh, we're not as big as uh, Taylor Heineke. But, you know, we'd love to be able to come on there with you guys. And be able to hey, talk to ball. Taylor Anthony. Heineke was on busting with the boys not long ago too. So yeah. you had you had him right after that. That's yeah, even making rounds, yeah. Anthony. Yeah. All right, Anthony. Yeah. I can't thank you enough, sir. Go enjoy the rest of your Friday night and help everybody cook that make or cook bake that cake. And then uh, we'll get you on again, hopefully during the season, so we get some recaps with you if that's possible. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. We'll, we'll check back in uh, periodically. Of course. There All right, go. Anthony. Thank good. you, brother. Have a good night. All right, man. Have a good weekend. All right, man. See you. All Appreciate right, everybody. We just spoke with the man, the Ant Man, Mr. Anthony Armstrong. So good. Such, it's... such a chill demeanor. I like that. He's just, yeah. so, just everything just comes off just so smooth. Yeah. I, if he only knew that he didn't have to apologize for his kids, like <laughs> if he only <laughs> knew. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I never apologize. <laughs> all right, but let's wrap up this episode by going over the rest of our fan questions. And this next one is from our Discord chats over Big Tony Shivers. Maybe other teams already planned it, and I had never noticed. But now, after the Commanders rollout, I'm just now seeing teams like the Panthers and Jets dropping new black helmets. What are your thoughts, Reed? I know Kyle has a huge bone to pick with this. Uh, I went on I, a rant today, dude. Yeah, I know. Hey, I mean, I'm not. I'm not too... I mean, it is what it is. Like teams like the Panthers, the Panthers already had black jerseys. I get them, but Kyle, I think what you talked about, and it's kind of right. Like I get the Jets; they've had a black uni too, and the black does look real clean. The one thing that gets me, and I'm not going to elaborate on it too much, Kyle, because this is your argument. I know, and you, I thought you brought up a good point, but was that you're not doing anything different with the black helmets? You're just making it an alternate, and it looks cool. Like ours, ours are completely different. Nobody else in the NFL has helmets the way that our black alternate helmets look. Right, and then, decal on the front, and so you can go ahead and touch on that more. But I, I feel you on that one. Yeah, I, I was pissed because basically the unveiling of the black uni should be something that's unique to Washington, right? And then I know obviously they uplifted the rule of the two helmet rule, so now these teams can have a an alternate helmet now, just like they had ultimate jerseys before. So obviously the other teams can follow, and the Panthers make sense that they have a black helmet. They have the black jersey, the look. It looks really clean. My whole thing is you have another color in blue that you could have used for your alternate helmet, but you didn't because your original silver. You want black, that's fine. Imagine but, that blue in a matte finish like ours. Yeah, that'd I be think sick. that would look clean. That right? would look really good. But the thing is they lack creativity, which is overall my point, is that they're taking their regular helmet and they're just dumping it in black base paint and putting the regular decals on it saying, ha, it's our, our, our alternate. That's a, Isn't that awesome? And it's ridiculous because, like you said, Washington, they added the W on the front of the helmet. As much as you guys like to say and make fun of it, it's unique. It's something cool to Washington. It's something that nobody else has tried before. And you have to give credit for, to Washington to, for, to have the stones to be able to try something new, to, to extend yourself out for ridiculement you know you know what i mean and these other teams like the jets they took their regular helmet they put it in black base paint and they put this regular decals on it 
And they're like, yeah, it's their new Ultimate Helmet. It's not, you're not doing anything cool. This, mm-hmm. What is spectacular about that? And that's my whole thing is the creativity is lost. And my one biggest issue was that the Jets said they're rolling out their black new black unis and helmet a week before Washington has their game against the Minnesota Vikings, their blackout game. And I, I'm telling you, something just reeks here because the fact that they, they already had the black uniforms and your black helmet didn't come around until July. Washington announced this in March. We knew that the two helmet rules. February. We didn't announce it. In February. February. And yeah. you didn't release it then? I wonder why. It probably, Early February. It probably took you four months to come up with this new concept because some genius told you to dip it in black paint. You're like, ah, there we go. But <laughs> that's my whole thing is it, it just definitely se- – it's taking away the muster. It's taking away the energy, the excitement about the new helmet for Washington with all these other teams releasing in the same year. And I know that the Texans, everyone else had different colored helmets and stuff. It's just they're doing they're not doing anything spectacular. And that's just what's annoying. Um, A counterpoint real fast for that is uh, these teams. I mean, generally, when you're doing a rebrand, you're doing a complete getting new jerseys, new unis, new logo, new name. Generally, those will roll out before teams will roll out their alternate jerseys, their alternate helmets, stuff that they're going to wear for the upcoming season. And black does look good. I mean, it's popular. I mean, teams have been doing it way before we did. Um, So I will say that. I get I don't know if they're copying us, but yeah, it's just like be more creative with it. And then I get Reed. what you're saying too. the Jets. Reed. They're copying us. Let's be real here. Let's, I mean, but then we can let's say be that level headed about this. <laughs> we're copying the Ravens and the Cardinals and, you know, I mean, right. all these, so exactly. Yeah, I, I get, know it, I get it, but it's still like, come on. Like you guys are. I'm just saying it's messed up that it happens in the same season. I know. You I know, know exactly. I mean? And the because Jets doing it the week before. Because like, you, you'd you want that reaction on social media when they come out like, oh, snap, the commanders are wearing their black. You know, like, by the time right. it gets to that point, the Jets have already done it. Nobody's going to be excited gonna about be like, it. Oh, there's another black uni. Right, exactly. It's just, right. Oh, just another black uni, and that's what's frustrating to me. No, I got you. I think that, uh, I mean, I'm not that worked up about it. Like, I'm not all, like, conspiracy out. I just think that. I'm always conspiracy out. I know, I know. <laughs> I just think that, uh, yeah, the NFL planned on having, like they, like you said, they really lifted the, the second helmet, third helmet ban. So I just think that every NFL team was going to go to an alternate. And it just so happened. I mean, if you look at every team is kind of releasing theirs at some point this week. So it's kind of almost like it was planned. I just I give credit to Washington because obviously, like they said, there's a rebrand. But obviously they knew that everyone else is going to be having like alternate helmets this year and like black helmets, different color helmets. Honestly, the Bengals helmets, all white and black ones, them jumps are fire. Those yeah, are those my are my favorite those ones. ones. Yeah. But uh, yeah, long story short, I just, just think a different that. Color. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know, but, but it looks just, good, though. With it looks good with the white jersey. Like, yeah, it looks it pretty does look good. Um, just I just, I look, I give Washington, I <laughs> honestly, a little bit of credit because if they would have just released it this week with everyone else, if they would have just released the burgundy jerseys and the white jerseys, and then they said, like, oh, another jersey coming down the line or something like that, try to hype it up. And then and then yeah. they released it with everyone else this week. It wouldn't have got as much hype. Since that they did it with the rebrand and kind of showed everyone prior to the rest of the NFL, everyone's like, oh, got people talking about drummed up interest in them already. And to your point about everyone wearing the black jerseys beforehand, I think that if, we have a, if we're winning games and we have a good record going into that Vikings game, it's going to – all it's right. going to blow itself up. It's, yes, it's right. going to blow itself up because Kirk Cousins right. coming back is going to be a blackout game. It's going to be so much hype around that. That Yeah, so look, right. at the end of the day, I get your point about like right. people just like no creativity because even the Giants are – they're not getting created with it. They're just bringing back their old Which, by the way, they should have the worn 80s. those the entire time, though. Exactly. It looks so, so much better. I give a shout-out to like whoever designed the jerseys and did the whole rebrand as far as like the on-the-field jerseys and stuff. Shout-out to them. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to them but um yeah so that's how i feel about it they uh <laughs> they um they they beat the curve they were ahead of the curve as far as getting the black jersey out there and then not getting caught up in everyone's washed up as the rest of the nfl releasing all their alternate stuff all right yeah touche sir you're right i'm being that was a nice way of you saying i'm being completely <laughs> irrational about all of this <laughs> and you're 100 percent right because i am irrational hey, when it but, comes to Washington. Hey, we're, we're commanders fans we're all but, irrational yeah we'll fat, just add on to that and then i know we got to move on but could you imagine like you said if we did if we just announced those two jerseys during the rebrand and then all of a sudden it comes july and we're like oh by the way guys we got another one like fans would have complained in february 
then these jerseys would have rolled out and they would have been like, look how stupid that W is on the front. And it's black, just like every other team. This is ridiculous. Exactly. Like it's, it's no creativity with Washington, then, just making a people, black jersey. And everyone how people else love it. Right. And and they definitely would have complained that they would have liked to pre-order that jersey before because it'd be take a long time. They well, would did like they know yeah. they still wouldn't be able to pre-order exactly. it. And that's, <laughs> and that's the whole point. That's why they released it when they did, I guess. So that's a good, that's a good, thank you, Tony. That was a great question. But look, guys, we got to go rapid fire here because we have a lot of questions remaining. But this one is from Andy Lockhart in a Discord chat server. Oi! Oi. Look at Carson's stats. Oi. He sent me a picture of this graphic from back in last year. It was Carson's 12th game with the Colts. And it's a graphic uh, that yeah. shows his stats from 2020. Right. 16 touchdowns, 15 interceptions, a 72.8 rate, uh, QBR, and then 50 sacks that he had in 2020. 2021 through 11 games, 18 touchdowns, 3 interceptions, 97.2 a rating and then 18 sacks. So his question is, will Carson have a hundred plus QB rating the whole, after this season read? Ooh, that's tough. I mean, historically, when you look at Carson, I mean, he does play very well, especially with the low interception numbers. And if he, I think so, I think that having this group of pass catchers is really going to help him out. Having this group of running backs is really going to help him out. It's more balanced than he's ever really kind of had in his career. Um, so I think, it should. And yeah, if he's rolling like he was with the Colts and you look at those numbers, uh, if it wasn't for the last two games with the Colts, he would have and he would have put up his what he was averaging. His numbers would have looked a lot better. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think he will have those numbers. Uh, he should be fairly close. And I'm, I think we should be in a good position if that's the case. Yeah, I agree. I just don't expect it to happen. Um, looking at Carson's numbers last season, he was 23rd in the NFL in yards per pass thrown at a 6.9. Taylor Heineke also had 6.9 and he was 22nd. So to me, the way that I'm looking at this, I'm not sure if that's the Colts offensive scheme or if that's Carson just being Carson, right? And so basically the way that I'm looking at Carson at the moment is that he is an Alex Smith with Joe Flacco with an arm. And so that's what you have to maximize. And I know that we talked a lot about the checkdowns and all that. We're going to get into that question. So that's why I wrote that out. But I'm not sure. I just don't think the 100 rating is going to happen. I don't. I, I want Carson to take those chances. And I don't expect him to come out with a 27 and 7 at the end of the season like he did last year. I do expect, expect it to balance out a little bit, but not as drastic as was with Taylor. What do you think, Rahul? Yeah, um, I'm looking at his, his passer rating now. And he's hit over 100 twice. He's hitting the low 90s twice, and in the other two seasons, he was in the 70s. So you could probably say he averages somewhere between, like, the mid-90s to the high, like, 80s, high to mid-80s as QB or passer rating. So that's pretty much where I expect it to be at. I think it'll be somewhere in, like, the 90 to 95, 97 range for his, uh, his passer rating, just because, he's like you said, the weapons he has. This has been the most weapons he's had his whole NFL career. Like, I think it's, what, eight years in his career so far, something like that, seven years in, whatever it is. So I expect that uh, Terry and, like, healthy Terry, Jahan Dotson stepping up, hopefully Cole Turner, Logan Thomas coming back. Those guys are going to hopefully keep the chains moving, keep us on the field more, which will result in more passes, more yards, and more touchdowns, hopefully, less interceptions. So, uh, yeah, I definitely think, uh, like, 99 to 5 rating is where it's at. But 100, that might be a little bit out of range. But if he gets to 100, that means that the team's rolling and we're probably on the plus side of the win column. Yeah, I agree. Now let's move on to Twitter for our our fan questions. Jeff, I know you ha- you sent the question. And I'm going to save it for Monday because it was fantastic. Now this this question from Tony Franchise. I just want to give a shout out. Tony Franchise lost his mother uh, recently, so if you guys know Tony on Twitter, just reach out to him. Uh, he's had a rough summer so far. Just reach out to him. Just let him know you're thinking about him, yeah, Tony. You know, yeah. stay strong, brother. But his question to us is: What training camp battles are you looking forward to, Hall? Just name Ooh. one. Uh, I would say we talked about it with Sam. I'd say that right guard position. I want to see if uh, big Wes Schweitzer can take it over or if it's going to be Trey Turner, the guy they brought in the offseason. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm looking forward to seeing. The training camp battle that I'm looking forward to is Jesse's eyes in the hot tub. Oh, yeah. No, got to keep it. Yeah. He's, he's, he acts like he's not into it, but come on. No, ser- seriously, though, Tony, uh, if I was going to say one, I'll say that DN position where Chase is supposed to be. I would like to see who's going to win that role and who dominates it. Those are three hungry dogs in the room that are all very – they all qualify for the position, and it could pay dividends for Washington. So I'm really excited to see what happens at DN. 
yeah, I like all those. Uh, I'll go with another one that uh, was the talk of the offseason, the Buffalo nickel. Who's going to be in there? Who's going to fill that position? Who? What different sets are they going to have with what different players? And is it going to be a group of guys that we have playing that position? Or is it just going to be one person who just grabs hold of it and dominates? Right. And now, Reed, let's keep it with you for this next question from Twitter. Scott Hartley in the UK. Oh, thank you, brother Scott. When do you see the following players starting for the team? Chase Young, Chase Ruye, Logan Thomas. Also, what would be a good year for each, considering they've had serious injuries? Mm, that's tough because we really don't know this, the the scope of like how bad these injuries are. Uh, we haven't heard much about when they're going to play. So I'll just I'll name one. I mean, I would imagine that Chase would probably come back last. I would think. I mean, just based off of his position, and um, so I think him, like Anthony talked about, him kind of easing into it, and then. I don't think that you can expect Booker McFarland what he said. I think you, you expect him to ease into it, have success by easing into it. Can and you then, leave Booger alone, man? Just let him. Well, live just his stop life. having stupid takes. The <laughs> no, guy always he's has. He's allowed to the have them. Thing. I love. He Booger. is. No, he's, he's allowed to, and we're also allowed to say that he's stupid. <laughs> but um, no. Uh, but yeah, no. I think a successful season for Chase is just going to be come back, getting healthy, and, and then towards the end of the year, kind of really turning up and being the player that showing flashes of being the player that we drafted him to be. Yeah, I, for Logan Thomas, I, I think I would expect Logan... You said what kind of car did I drive? <laughs> would be able to return, uh, I think, in about uh, probably a month into the season. So I think by week five, you'll see Logan Thomas back in the uniform and starting. Um, I saw something on Twitter today that they said that they expect or they're hoping that Logan can be ready for week one. They're they not expect it, but he's on not on track, but what's the word they used? It's a possibility. He's poised for a week one return, I guess you should say it like that. So I would say Logan would be Logan would be the first gear, one back. Confident. Yeah, geared, poised, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And uh Chase Rui, I was I would say that uh he would probably be the either first or the second one back. Between him and Logan will be the first two one or two back. And then the other and, one will be the second. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and um yeah, Chase, I think coach already said Rivera has already said that he expects Chase to start on the pup list. So I would probably expect Chase uh, maybe like week five, week six yeah. to come back. Maybe week five. With, with all three of those guys, the important thing to remember is one of them is going to come back first. It's very true. <laughs> now let's very move true. on to one of my favorite questions of this week. This is from our guy, Ty Mac on Twitter. Hall, what week will we see who are we in quotes? Everyone is really back from their injury time in their in the systems. Like, basically what he's saying is, when will everybody who's injured at the moment, like, when will we be finally at full strength? I would say just getting back on the field. Like we just talked about, I think that you could expect Chase after week four. So I'd say week five, well, maybe you see Chase Young out there. That's a home game against the Titans. Um, obviously, that'd be, like, a lot of uh, a lot of hype around him coming back. Maybe it'll draw some fans to the, uh, to the stadium because it'll be the return of Chase. You want to see what he looks like. So I could definitely see maybe that happening. So I'd say week five as far as everyone on the field, but as far as full strength and everyone getting back to like, I'm not going to say 100% how they were playing before, but just uh, getting to like maybe reaching their peak as far as the season, I'd say probably that bye week when they get a, go into the bye week, everyone gets to rest. I think coming back week 15, you should start to see like this team start to hit that stride and hit that peak because everyone should be rested up and ready to go to make that stretch run for that playoff run. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ty. I'm probably the worst person for this. I don't expect it to ever happen, to be at full strength. It, it this, this is the only sport where it's 100% guaranteed that there's going to be an injury that occurs. And so I don't ever go into a, a, a season or anything expecting everything to go perfect. I expect that somebody else could possibly be getting injured you know, throughout the season because then you're they're out completely, and now this question is redundant because with the guy that we thought was going to be there is not there anymore. So I just don't expect it to happen. We're going to have to win and fight with who we got. And I, I trust in – I really do have a lot of confidence in this team, the way that they're built. They just have to grow together, and this is a growing process, and it's hard – because one of the aspects is getting over yourself a little bit. And they learned they were humbled a little bit last season. And so you have to get that hungriness. You got to get, you know, you got to get, I don't know, how, what, thirsty for it. And so, you know what they say, thirsty dogs run faster. And so once that happens, that's when everything will start gelling. But when will we all be full strength? I don't expect it to happen. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because Kyle has thirsty dogs run faster tattooed on his neck. You guys can't <laughs> see it right now, but it's there. It's so true, he though. lives his life by that motto. <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah. Like he said, that. that realistically it probably won't happen i like what hall said uh where week five but 
I would imagine that we're, if, if all things go to plan, it, it's the NFL, it won't. There will be other injuries. Uh, other things will happen. Uh, but if all things go to plan, you would hope that like those last six games of the season, that that's when we're kind of playing at full strength. That's when things click. And that's when we're really showing who we can be and kind of get on a playoff run. It, that's usually what happens in the playoffs, right? The playoffs are won by the team that's most, most healthy at that time. And so, yes, that would be perfect, but we don't live in a perfect world, but I loved your optimism. I do. Sir. I do. Now this next <laughs> okay. question is my favorite of the day. This is from commander OC orange crush. 92 always has the best ones. Does Wentz really have a check down problem? Naheem Hines was a deadly checkdown weapon in, in 2020 before regressing in 21. Hines was named the fantasy steal on the pod this time last year. I don't know how you remember that. Now, <laughs> when Wentz is paired with another deadly checkdown artist in McKissick, how will they fare? Mm. I would say I don't think he has a he has a problem. I don't think he has a checkdown problem. He just has a a big arm, I call it big arm syndrome where his arm is so big, he just thinks that he can make any and every throw and hang on to the last second in the pocket and kind of just make that throw, that, that wow play, that like, oh, wow, look at uh, it's like a Hemingway, MVP. Hemingway thinks he can just get out of a hot tub whenever he wants because he's got a big problem too. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he can just wear what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, I just think that uh, hopefully – I mean, Naheen Himes had, like, I think, like, 40, 50 catches, maybe something like that last year. So, I, I think J.D. McKissick is better than uh, Naheem Himes. So, hopefully, even Carson will take advantage of a guy he has in the backfield like J.D. McKissick. But I just think that, like, everyone's talked about it all offseason. Like I said before, he's a guy that wants to make the big play and make the wild play instead of just hitting the easy layup. And if they can kind of coach into him to just hit the layups, I think he'd be fine. But we just got to wait and see until week one. Yeah, so – I thought long and hard about this one because I love this question. I think the one outlying issue with this whole question and everything involved with it, because I think OC has a good point with all this. This has been brought up about Carson Wentz. I've seen Dan Orlovsky say it. Um, he didn't have a check down problem last season. What I think happened with Naheem Hines was Jonathan Taylor being the best running back in the NFL besides Derrick Henry. They just didn't want to take him off the field, you know, because that forced teams to play you up. That being said, last season, I talked about it before, Carson Wentz, yards per pass thrown, 23rd in the league with 6.9, which met up with Taylor Heineke. And we knew Taylor Heineke, was everything was very close to a line of scrimmage last season, and that's why I brought up, is it the scheme? Is it Carson? I'm not really sure. But I will say this, that I went back and I read an article from somebody that covers the Colts back after week one last season against the Seattle Seahawks, and this is talking about that game after the fact. In this vein... 39% of Carson Wentz's passing attempts, 38 of them um, were to his running backs. So 39% of his 38 passing attempts that game were to running backs. I don't think the checkdowns are the problem. I think it's the, the scheme that he was in was forcing him to do that and missing time in training camp. So do I think that checking it down is a problem for Carson? I don't. It's just finding the combination of linking the Alex Smith with the Joe Flacco and making those smart decisions is my personal opinion. Yeah. I mean, you guys basically hit it on the head. Um, it's also, I think a, a lot of Carson, like you said, the offense last year in, in Indy was kind of, it, it was running back centric with, with Jonathan Taylor. And then he also, like I said, I just think that he had, didn't have wide receivers that he really trusted as much or that he could put as much faith in. I mean, I get Pitt, Michael Pittman's big. He's six, five. I mean, Carson sends like those guys, but I, I really just think that having this, these wide receivers is going to help him out a lot, make him trust more throwing it downfield, which is that a good thing? I don't know. We've seen Carson kind of make some crazy plays downfield before where uh, you're kind of like, why, what, what are you doing? And I, and, but, sorry, no, no, you're good. Go ahead. Uh, to finish your question off. Cause you asked about JD McKissick and how he's going to fare in this. I think he's going to flourish in it. And I, I know I've said before, I thought Carson checked it down too much, but after looking at the data, it doesn't make sense. I think JD McKissick's going to do really well. He was our best pass blocking back last season and I don't trust Brian Robinson that much and I don't think um, Gibson is going to grow into uh, Clinton Portis all of a sudden so I think JD McKissick is going to have a lot of opportunities to protect the blind side of Carson and we saw last year against our, uh, Atlanta how Taylor escaping the pocket then found JD McKissick for that game winning score and that's what Carson Wentz likes to do by extending the play and so if JD McKissick is on the field and everyone's staring at Carson as he escapes the pocket I think JD McKissick could flourish in those types of situations so I I think JD is going to look very, very good. He's just got to stay healthy, baby. Yeah, one thing real fat, Brian Robinson, uh, I know it's college. It's completely different 
to the NFL. But uh, he was very good pass playing, surprisingly, in college. So hopefully that can kind of pan out. But, uh, yeah, I don't expect anybody to be old Clinton. I'll watch Clinton Portis pass blocking highlights all day, man. Clinton <laughs> Portis is so fun to watch. Right. And now to wrap this up, our last question was submitted by Tim Towner on Twitter. He DM'd it to us. Two things that seem to happen every year. Someone gets injured that we cannot afford to lose, and someone unexpectedly gets cut that has taken a step backwards. What would be a worst-case scenario for you this year? I'd say the worst-case scenario would be kind of like last year where week one come out or the first quarter of the season. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even put it on week one. Is any point of the first half, first quarter of the season, if Wentz goes down and it's a long-term injury, I think that would be the worst thing possible because – it would pretty much be a repeat of last year, except for a couple more weapons on the field. So I guess it wouldn't be a repeat. We can see what Taylor does with a full complement of weapons around him. But I also don't really want to see Taylor again. I want to see what Wentz could do. Right. But, uh, yeah, that would be my worst-case scenario. Yeah, for me, the worst-case scenario is somebody gets injured, and that is to the offensive line. One of the – in that article I read about Carson Wentz after week one last season, that what he talked about is their, their O-line was basically injured. Everyone was. And so Carson was under attack constantly. And the reporter gave a lot of credit to Carson for being able to uh, scramble, make extend the play a little bit to help the offensive line out. But he was getting sacked way too much. And you could say maybe that's because Carson's holding the ball too long or whatever have you. But I am – my worst-case scenario is that that problem follows him to Indian, uh, follows him to Washington. And something happens to the O-line chases him back right away maybe Andrew Norwell gets nicked up and now we're playing now we're doing shuffleboard and uh I'm concerned about that that is my worst case scenario yeah no I, I agree um unless <laughs> unless like uh let's just say Terry McLaurin for some reason just becomes inept and forgets how to play and all of a sudden we're like we gotta cut you already you know <laughs> that what I'm joking that's not gonna happen um Why? that could be that's the next impossible but uh yeah Carson going down early and then us just having to ride the whole season with old old noodle arm would be pretty bad <laughs> he's a nice guy I want to listen to him talk I don't want to watch him right, play football from here week. on out you cannot call him noodle arm anymore did you see him sitting on that bench with that girl that's not a noodle arm my friend he deserves no, respect no that is a Big old BDE energy move. That's what I'm BDE saying, dude. Move. Yeah. Start calling him BDE instead of new. He does. He, oh, he. I guarantee. BDE BD Heineke. I guarantee that guy's got a hog. I would put money on it. I mean, he might have been a <laughs> dressy saw getting out of the hot tub. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You're ridiculous. All right, everybody. That's going to wrap us up for this episode. Thank you so much for watching if you've made it this far. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who submitted your fan questions. I know we couldn't get to all of them, and I'm sorry for that. I will use them on Monday. He's not sorry. I am. I really am. I wish I could do I had enough time for everybody, to be honest, man. But I really appreciate everyone. Have a great weekend. I know it's going to be a scorcher out there. So make sure you drink a lot of fluids and you stay safe. All right, everybody. I'm Kyle. Be smart and don't come outside till the sun goes down. I'm Hall. And the one thing we can say for sure is it wasn't me getting out of that hot tub. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) 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 Oh, Before I I get out of here, we're also going to be rebooting for the third year, the annual Burgundy Zone Fantasy Football League. We've only had one uh, league basically every year. And so if we have enough people submitting and joining into it, maybe we'll have three different leagues where each one of us is the co- uh, the commissioner of. And that way we're, we're battling our fans here. That would be a lot of cool, a lot of fun. So if you guys want to join up our fantasy football league for the Burgundy Zone, let us know. DM us. Hit us up on YouTube, whatever have you. We'd love to s- extend you the invite. All right, everybody. We'll see you on Monday. Washington football. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, Washington football. Woo!